Hello again everyone and welcome back to another YYT Deck Tech Talk. This time we're going over almost Mono Earth Backup Destruction. Mandragora is a very cool card for a number of reasons. I actually really like the entire cycle of monsters that uh, get counters over time. Uh, I think Skeleton is very powerful in Lightning. I think that Bomb is good in Fire, but Fire's got kind of better things it can be doing for the time being. Sahagin Chief is very good as well, but Mandragora really strikes me as uh, as being quite unique. Very few cards in the game can break backups. I guess uh, they've been very careful when designing cards because it can potentially be a very unfun mechanic. Uh, we, we all know that from Rampair by now, right? So uh, while things like Dandrine are relatively normal and there's lots of other cards that uh, can dull and freeze in, uh, in ice, I think that Mandragora's effect is quite unique. So uh, imagine my surprise when it turns out that the best enabler for Mandragora is actually not an Earth card at all. That is Realm. Realm is a very, very powerful card, and uh, I don't know if you've been keeping up. This is, this is a related tangent. don't know if you've been keeping up with the spoilers for Opus 12. And uh, the, the, the very cool Krill getting her face licked by a dragon looks like a really interesting card. But uh, it's yet another Earth card that happens to be basically support for multicolor decks rather than Earth on its own. And in a similar kind of vein, I think that this, while it is uh, loosely a mono Earth deck and it needs to be roughly mono Earth for Mandragora to feel powerful, I think Earth is uniquely well positioned for making rainbow decks or for teching other random cards of other random elements. So uh, Realm is very easy to play in this deck, though I still have the audacity to call this deck uh, mono Earth, I suppose. So Realm, uh, we like to play her as soon as possible, simply because the earlier we break backups, the more powerful it feels and, uh, and the harder it is for our opponents to play around that possibility. So the classic neutral pile that Realm is going to fetch in most games is Mandragora and Flandit. A little bit more about each. Uh, for anyone unfamiliar with Mandragora, it's a 2CP card that you can sacrifice as an action ability to break a backup of cost 5 or more, and I think by default that's actually relatively powerful. You can kill Shantotos as the rainbow support in other deck, you can break your own Shantotos so that you can replay it in this deck, that's a little bit of a strategy spoiler for you, but also there's other powerful cards like Minfilia, who is uh, often uh, used these days because it happens to be a Kadash answer, you can kill Star Sybil before she gets to break herself and play something for value, I think that Mandragora is uh, relatively playable on its own, but with three monster counters that, again, you get by playing another Earth character onto the field, Mandragora uh, will get a counter, and on three counters you can break any backup. And uh, I strongly recommend you charge up your Mandragoras relatively quickly so that you can throw off your opponent's entire CP curve or, or snipe the off-element backups in their deck. So uh, th this is uh, your sort of classic neutral pile, and uh, of note you'll get a counter immediately on Mandragora from uh, Flanda also entering the field because they enter at the same time. Mandragora and uh, Flandit have a, a very sweet synergy as well. As you start to break your opponent's backups, it becomes increasingly harder for your opponent to pay the Flandit tax uh, that's repeatedly coming. Flandit as well, of note, it's got the coolest names in other languages that I know. Uh, we've got Match Pudding in German, and I think in Italian it's Doro Tabo. Don't tell me that's not pure poetry. So, Mono Earth, I, again, Mono is in inverted commas in the, uh, the title for this deck. We've got a lot of ways of finding rainbow CP so that we can play our off-color realms. Most notably, Claris is the ideal turn one for basically any Earth deck at the moment. Uh, he's played widely in Ranpair. Uh, there are a huge number of competitive Job King out there, but uh, the two that we will be searching most often are Epitaph and Kolka. Epitaph searches for any FFCC forward, Kolka searches for any Earth forward at all. While it might sound that Kolka is uh, a little bit more powerful, he does cost that little bit more. So if Cladis is your only backup on turn one, you will almost always search Epitaph just because he's a nice easy play on the next turn. Or in the scenarios where you're able to play two backups on turn one, one of them being Claris, I would say that Kolka is usually the stronger card to search out with the intention of playing him on the next turn to set things up to go through their targets in turn. Well, Kolka's targets are basically anything in the deck. There are so, so many Earth forwards in this deck that uh, toolboxing with him in the late game is quite powerful. Uh, Epitaph, however, we've got two FFCC forwards, both of whom fits this deck's goals very nicely. Two copies of Leo. Uh, Leo has gotten leaps and bounds better with the amount of FFCC support that's been printed recently. Uh, stuff like uh, Mira is very cool. Uh, stuff like the new Chilinka backup. There's a whole load of uh, Earth Wind decks that now use Leo to do cool stuff. But in here, he happens to scale very well with size because we're playing a lot of cheap monsters and it's, it's not at all difficult for Leo to be 10,000 power or more in size for only one CP. That's very nice. But also he lets all of our backups tap for effectively rainbow CP like uh, Opus 1 Chaos, meaning playing Realm is quite easy. And uh, any opening hand with Claris in it will be able to find Leo a couple of turns down the line. 
the other FFCC target in this deck for Epitaph. Two copies of Lurkiacus, although we can see two monsters here, uh, th there are quite a few others in the deck as well. So uh, Lurkiacus is a very powerful toolboxy card later on, and uh, it means that we can discard our monsters if we need to in the early turns of the game, and still have some confidence that we'll get them back when the time is right. Moving over to Kolka, uh, there's another way that Kolka can colour fix for us. Kolka is capable of searching out the Death Lord, a uh, really, really cool, really powerful card that can search for any dark character. Uh, that's basically every dark card in print apart from Zodiac and Ark, the big summons, and they are uh, they're sort of shakily playable at the best of times anyway. But uh, he can colour fix for us by fetching 2CP Chaos from Opus 1 that we mentioned earlier on. Yet more colour fixing available to Earth uh, comes in the form of Star Sybil. Star Sybil is up there with Clarus as being the, the best backup, uh, certainly for uh, backup generation reasons in Earth. Star Sybil has got a number of targets in this deck, all of whom are very exciting. One copy of Cam the Knot as yet another way of searching out Chaos and getting our colours uh, ready, and it's still a very powerful card against monocolour decks or uh, d decks where the removal comes from one element primarily. Star Sybil can find a Shantotto. Shantotto is slightly off camera there, but uh, I promise you they're here. Shantotto's powerful in this deck for a number of reasons, but uh, I guess uh, the most pertinent one is once you start breaking your opponent's backups with Mandragora, and they realise that playing more backups is terrible for their own tempo, they're typically going to play more forwards than they would have done otherwise, or sometimes in some cases they'll just play forwards for the rest of the game. Shantotto becomes very, very powerful after a couple of Mandragora hits, just because your opponent is going to be spewing out forwards at a high rate. The other targets for Star Sybil in the deck are one copy of Apururu. I really like Apururu. Uh, there's no summons in this deck, so Ajido Marujido is off limits, but uh, Apururu being able to recur any character is, again, just like uh, Realm, just like Death Lord, just like Kolka, very powerful effect uh, the longer the game goes on. And when you can play a 2CP Apururu who gets back any character you've seen so far, that is tremendously powerful. On the other end of the scale, one copy of Joker. I, uh, I don't think Joker's effect is tremendously important in this deck, but he happens to be a 2CP backup that's searchable off Star Sybil, meaning if we play a single backup on turn 1 and it happens to not be Clarus to set off a, a big chain of events, then we can play turn 2 Star Sybil into turn 2 as well, Joker maybe, or turn 3 Joker, depending on how precious your hand looks. And uh, yeah, you're, uh, you're pretty much set for CP for quite a few turns after that. The last colour fixing mechanism, and I promise you this is quite enough, uh, available in this deck is Tyro. Tyro is probably the best non-legend, or certainly the most meta-influential non-legend in Opus 11. Uh, killer EX burst to search for any forward that uh, again gives you so much strategy, so it taps for any colour of CP, and uh, again your opponents are going to start being aggressive once you start popping their backups with Mandragora, so Tyro is quite often going to be on damage 5. Do not worry about going to damage 5, uh, I promise you this deck can stabilise against virtually any amount of aggression. So let's look back and talk a little bit more about the monsters, uh, the, the middle row here. There are a few realm targets and a couple of things that are outside realms range but uh, are still monsters for Larkaeca's sake. I'm playing one copy of Magic Pot. Uh, Magic Pot is really powerful to fetch uh, with your first realm if you are quite sure that realm is going to survive the turn. Basically uh, fire decks or to some extent maybe lightning decks playing Black Mage, uh, you do not want your opponent to play an ace or something and kill your realm uh, early on, but if you don't think that realm dying early is going to be a major consideration then Mandragora and Magic Pot tapped is a very powerful early pile and then on your next turn you can magic pot your realm into another realm fetching you another mandragora and probably a flandit at that point and that's going to fully charge your first mandragora even if you didn't play another backup or something in between times so uh, magic pot is rather slow of a card i don't like that it enters the field dull but this is one of a few decks where uh, i think it's actually quite powerful and over time i'll show you some more forwards that i think magic pot is uh, quite playable with as well the pile of monsters that's making most sense or making the most waves with Realm in other decks is Goblin Unsaganashi. And given how much rainbow CP we've got in this deck, I didn't think there was too much opportunity cost to play a copy of Goblin to slightly speed up our, uh, our coming back into the game if we fall behind early on damage. And one copy of Unsaganashi to make Diabolos look like a bad idea against the stompy big end of our earth forwards. The last monster we're playing is Luminous Puma for again more recursion of forwards. It means we can run a slightly below average number of forwards. As always, the deck list uh, with numbers is down in the description if you'd like to copy this anywhere. And uh, 
Luminous Puma is also exceptionally powerful with the next card I'll show you. I wanted to play some more dark cards for the sake of Cam the Knot, and uh, I, again, I, th I think that uh, you could probably play Kadaj over any one of the forwards in this deck, and it would cause some amount of improvement, but I figure you would do that anyway. So uh, I left out Kadaj here. If you're taking this deck to a big event, I would almost certainly make room for a Kadaj, simply because he, he happens to be searchable, but I thought I'd be cool and not play one for the time being and uh, let you use a little bit of imagination or, or do some colouring in. Yeah, uh, we've got two copies of Dark Sephiroth here, who fits in very nicely with the backup destruction theme of this deck. When we start breaking our opponent's backups, we're going to be on four damage in a couple of turns time when people start vomiting their forwards out onto the field. Sephiroth happens to be a really good card. This is maybe the best deck I've seen for this Sephiroth actually, uh, simply because, like said Alstein, but 1k bigger and 1 CP cheaper. He can kill your opponent's best dude on entry, while also preventing a very credible threat that's hard to get around. Or in situations where you're really far ahead, you can start sniping even more of your opponent's backups. But uh, yeah, uh, the two copies seems to be about right. I tried one copy and loved it, tried three copies and kind of liked it, but it did feel a little bit excessive at times. And uh, they had a tendency to show up in my hand uh, a little bit too early. Or if you see two copies too early, you really feel it. You're playing two cards down for, uh, for a very long part of the game. Two copies seems about right, uh, given how many ways to recur them and search them out we have but uh, if you can reach the situation where both players are on five damage luminous puma to repeat sephiroth specials is insanely powerful a little bit more recursion from Minfilia. I think Minfilia got uh, a little bit weaker this Opus, and you can't play her as your fifth backup and expect to get huge value simply because of Kadash, uh, quite as much as she used to, but she remains powerful as a way of killing enemy Kadash, and, and that's kind of nice so that you can save some monsters for Lurkaicus in the late game, and uh, the rest of the time she happens to be a 2 CP backup that this deck is rather lacking in. One copy of Beastmaster as well. Initially she, or he, she, I don't know, no more hard to tell. Uh, Beastmaster initially only searched out Realm. Uh, in time I added an extra water card who I'll show you in a little bit. I didn't think it altered the maths of Beastmaster finding Realm all that much and uh, the rest of the time just happens to be a, a nice way of uh, a pseudo 1 CP backup. If you don't like it, uh, then uh, I think you could easily play a number of other uh, cards in its place. Maybe Minor or something like that, but Minor feels rather slow again in a world uh, where we're facing Kadash. Much of the rest of the deck is forwards of cost 5 CP and above, so as another uh, little uh, ch cheap and uh, cheerful forwards to throw out early and stem some of the bleeding if our opponents start to rush us, we've got Gabranth, uh, who is uh, very expensive, uh, c currently like 65 euros a piece, but uh, basically is just glue for the deck, so uh, it's the world's most expensive glue. Gabranth remains a really good EX. There's tons of targets in this deck, not uh, limited to uh, Camelot and Realm. A card that I think gets a whole load better when you start breaking your opponent's backups is Arden, because usually Arden is a card that your opponent will ignore for a couple of turns, make their field go really wide, and then in one big turn they'll sack one of their own backups to, to bribe Arden. But it becomes a lot harder to do that if your opponent's backups are already under duress. Because we don't really have room to play summons here, I guess you could try to, but uh, it, it, uh, it's difficult to find space for summons, and I also don't think Earth summons are in a particularly great state as of Opus 11. I'm playing uh, a couple of bodies that remove things on entry. Cecil and one copy of Asmodai. Uh, I, th I think that Asmodai is strictly better than the first Cecil you play, but uh, strictly worse than uh, Cecil once he reaches around about 4 damage or so, uh, on account of the 1k bigger and the, the lack of a special and stuff. So these guys, uh, collectively, you've seen them all by now. They're very good at managing your opponent's early forwards, and uh, occasionally you can do really cool combo turns with Cecil, but uh, that's about that. One copy of Gao as well. Gao feels incredibly powerful when he brings back a Mandragora to kill one of your opponent's backups, or uh, more likely the Goblin or the Unsaganashi, sometimes even a Flandit, just to bolster the field, and uh, I figured that was worth the risk of Beastmaster occasionally missing our realm, just as a heads up. And uh, I, I guess that increasing the number of water cards in the deck isn't too bad, because it means that if we do draw a realm, there's a slightly higher chance of being able to discard water CP to play it as well. Last couple of cards in the deck, and uh, I'll be honest, uh, I think this is probably where you'd find the room for the Kadash. Currently playing two copies of Wall. Wall is uh, simply really good glue uh, for uh, when you're under a lot of uh, pressure, I suppose, from your opponent playing forwards early on because they don't have backups. Wall is a very nice way of being able to give your biggest guy brave, uh, also turning off EXPERS so that you don't randomly lose field territory, and uh, once you give your own forwards brave, Joker as well can, can buff them. Wall, I think, has been a little bit power crept, but is a nice neutral card to play when you don't want to lose any more territory, and you want to stay around about that 5 damage sweet spot where Sephiroth is at his happiest. 
So this is a uh, mono air quotes backup destruction. Uh, there's been quite a few decks uh, like this going around on Octagon lately. Uh, some of them are playing Braska's Final Aeon and stuff. I wanted to stay a little bit more consistent in the back row uh, simply because Earth has got such good rainbow CP in, uh, uh, from an otherwise mono Earth back row. So yeah, uh, deck list is in the description. Thank you very much for watching and listening and I hope you'll stay tuned for another deck really soon. Bye bye.